Good morning, world. Hello. All right. Hi. So begins our first ever online info session. Um, these are some of our attendees. First, that's Paul over there. Hi. Paul Hellman, president and director of the Conway School. Ken, come on in. Oh. Ken Byrne, um, professor of humanities. <laughs> yeah, we have a bunch of uh, real live attendees. Why don't you guys say your names real quick? I'm Jessica. I'm Anna. Laurie. Sophie. Catherine. And then uh, Dave Nordstrom back there, administrative director. Good morning. I always want to say hi. We're not going to start the live version here immediately, maybe 10 minutes or so while everyone gets settled. But this begins our broadcast. So sit tight. Thanks. Okay. Commercial, commercial, some commercial break. Uh, so come on over here. You can see some of the five that I was talking about. Just to show you that there are three distinct groups of abstention. So students are learning about grading. So one of the ways to learn about grading is adding out the paper order. So it's not to make a beautiful model. It's to understand how do you draw and define um, lines of contour so that you accomplish either positive drainage so that things don't flood, or so that you know, even grades that people can walk. Or Howdy, drive, folks. Or so Turning on the Q&A feature they here. Are, right, they're just abstract. Uh, they started with a base condition right. that everyone headed into. Direction. Good morning, so our is, one current viewer.
Hey guys, we're going to start in about five minutes, so sit tight, we're almost with you. If you see any issues, if you can't hear me, for example, we're using a, a remote mic right there. So if we're having any sound troubles or anything like that, please do let me know so we can resolve those. Um, I have my cell phone, 413-695-1998. I want to make this as smooth as possible for all of you guys. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Hey guys, get started soon. Is this the first time you guys have done something like this? Yeah. Oh, we also have a box. 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 Uh, oh, you, oh, you're now in Hadley, yeah. here. I grew up in East Hadley. Oh, okay. <laughs> and now you're in Hadley. I live in South Hadley. Okay. And he was along the way. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, it was all early there. <laughs> what kind of, what are you interested in? What kind of stuff do you think? Design or planning? Or do you hope to learn to do that? Well, I'm hoping to, I guess, attendees that you can't see on that audience are here. We will begin. Uh, so good morning, everyone. The first section here is going to be Paul and Ken talking about an, an overview of the program. And we're going to do, after each section, we're just going to start with those two. And then uh, our two current students are going to come up. And then we're going to talk about alums, and we'll talk about financial aid. And after each portion, we're going to do a Q&A and, &A and uh, try to get questions from the online audience as well. So to start, Paul. Okay. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. It's a pleasure to have you here and be able to share with you Conway School. And some of you live online and here have visited before. If you haven't been here before, we encourage you to visit. But I'm going to ask Ken Byrne to join me. Ken is a professor of humanities here, a director, and also one of the teachers. And we wanted to give you just an overview of, of the school and and then also give you time to ask questions that help clarify what we do and how we do it and why it's pretty different from other schools that you may have encountered. So imagine a school where the, the learning is all structured around doing real work. So the, the core idea here is that as a student, you're working on real projects with real clients. We dispense with grades. Is that awesome or what? We don't, as teachers, have to spend time thinking about grades. We're giving you a constant evaluation. It's the work that matters, not or UNA or an A minus, things like that. And so we've sort of formulated this notion of what our our mission really is. We're, we're really keen on seeing what's broken of all kinds, ecologically, socially, food security, all kinds of things that's broken in the world, understanding what's in good shape and we should prize and protect it, protect it and then figure out how to design the future, not the past. So we're interested in the past, 
found, but we were trying to design for today and for tomorrow. So we have um, a range of alums who are out doing this work. Abby Duchon, for example, works for the city of New York, and her work is protecting uh, watershed lands. And I know that New York City is the largest surface water um, drinking water system in the world. And so she's out there protecting lands to preserve water for New York City. Seth Wilkinson, what do you think about Seth? Or, oh, we, visit, we have visited Seth out in the Cape the uh, last couple of years with all of the students. He um, graduated uh, from Conway, went into planning for a year or two, and learned at that municipal level about zoning and legislation, conservation regulations, then started his own firm in ecological restoration on the Cape here. He deals with degraded wetlands, uh, uh, destroyed wildlife habitat, and bringing it back. What's the turtle? The, uh, the leather bat. What was the turtle? What was it? The leather bat? Was it, what was it? Sorry. Was it the terrapin? Yeah. So creating habitat that would be appropriate for a particular species on the page. Okay, also uh, John O'Niger, who's one of our teachers, he's a permaculturist and really keen on food systems and local food production. He, uh, uh, you'll see a, lot, a theme here where people start with all kinds of backgrounds, they come through Conway, and then they go on to do all kinds of things. He, was, he worked as a biologist for Nature Conservancy, now has his own design practice, and one of his business partners, another one of our graduates, will be here later to talk. Carrie, for those who can't read Chinese, <laughs> I'll on the fly. Um, so Carrie came to the school with an interest in historical architecture, uh, preservation, especially in New York City and community issues. Um, and after Conway, she became director of the Two Bridges Neighborhood, neighborhood Association in the Lower East Side, uh, the lowest income part of Manhattan, dealing with uh, an area that was ravaged by the, the storm and uh, working with creating pop-up uh, public spaces, for example. So. Um, ben Falk is um, in the middle of Vermont. And he, these, this is the, his homestead, and these are rice paddies. So he's growing, he's very interested in food systems and uh, food security and um, locations in New England. He worked as a natural builder before coming to Conway and did some amazing things. We all mentioned Wendy Goldsmith also. So Wendy, a uh, 1990 graduate, um, has done a lot of interesting things and um, really is focused on stormwater flooding issues. And her, her firm has expanded dramatically in the last few years, especially post-Katrina. Um, so her firm is based in Salem, north of Boston, but has offices in several states, including along the Gulf states in Louisiana, for example, looking at uh, reclaiming and storing wetlands along the Gulf Coast. <laughs> Christina. Uh, Christina is a graduate from a couple of years ago uh, from Georgia, went back to Georgia. Actually, she did a six-month internship in Connecticut, then went to Atlanta, where she's, she has her own design firm as a part-time side job because she likes to do the site design. Um, uh, but her main job is working on an urban greenway through Atlanta, uh, and her specialty is in native. Grassland, native she, plants. Her official title is Prairie Restoration Coordinator. And what she wrote to us recently is that she had a dream before she came to Conway to work on this particular project, and now it's been achieved. So she's really excited. Kate Shalakis is a Smith graduate, Catherine, and she was focused on architectural studies and landscape studies, and um, now is the only non-engineer working in an engineer an engineering firm in in Boston, and. Um, she is focused on stormwater issues, stormwater issues. So the, the themes that these are just some alums, and if you pick up our magazine or go online, you can see a whole range of things that alums are doing. Some broad themes, and if you look at the United Nations University, some of the main themes that they see as really crucial in the world, we we take them and add to them. So most people, well, what's the future of the planet as we move to the well? How do we increase food security? How do we protect the biodiversity we have and uh, restore? It when we can, how do we strengthen communities, how do we deal with uh, more frequent and intense storms and other signs of destabilized climate. These are broad topics, but the, um, the one aspect that we focus on in all of them is spatial design. So it's like the spatial implications, the design that results from trying to deal with these topics. We're an accredited program. Um, we're accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. 
as you know, it's a, a ten-month intensive graduate program, and can anyone, can anyone see that that maybe I hope oh, you know online might be a little hard. That is a funnel, and Ken is going to tell us about oh, oh, it's funnel. My funnel. Your funnel. <laughs> so, in the notion that you, that conventional grad school may may take people from different backgrounds and funnel them through the program and train them for a particular career path after they leave, after they go through the grad school. And uh, Conway School is a little different. We think of it as kind of a double funnel. So we take people from a wide uh, variety of uh, degrees, professional experience, ages, interests, uh, though they all have a commit, commission, commission, committed to the mission of the school and sustainable design and communities. And but when they leave, go through the Conway School, we're not training everybody for a particular career path, that everyone is going to go on and have a certain kind of job or a certain kind of career. They go off and they do all kinds of different things, as I think uh, Paul's description of alums um, illustrates. And so we use this broad term of ecological design to describe this wide range of things. But if you look at the actual titles of some of our alums, um, you'll, you'll be amazed at the, the range of things. And I, I'm sure the online folks can't read it, but let's read some of these. So Conway alums are conservation easement managers. They're, they, they work in community services. They're environmental specialists. They're land planners. They're landscape architects. They're mapping and GIS specialists. They're mediators. They're restoration specialists. They're town planners. And the list goes on. Um, we, we, we've chosen ecological design as a way to describe what we do because we think it's the, the good uh, title to give to a holistic approach to dealing with sustainability. As of this graduating class, we're, we give a Master of Science degree in Ecological Design, and that's a switch to the previous, previously our degree was Master of Arts in Landscape Design, which we found that people uh, didn't really understand as much when our graduates went out into the world. We picked Master of Science because Master of Science means applied. It doesn't mean you're a scientist, it means you're doing something that's applied. Ecological because it's about relationships of living and inanimate things and the spatial um, interaction of those. And it's about design because it's about intentional change. So um, one of the main things, people have a pretty dim, some people have a dim view of designers, right? They think, oh, designers are airheads and they're just after some narrow kind of, kind of objective. And there's evidence to support that, unfortunately. And so when, when designers go just on appearance, we end up with disaster. So beautiful purple, isn't that a great color? Yeah. But did you really want to have purple loose drive everywhere and know we can't control it anymore? So it's like our approach to design is thinking more profoundly ecologically and socially about what we're doing and where the system we're trying to intervene in is going. So there's a transect. Um, that can be useful in describing the kinds of projects we work on. So it's a kind of continuum from our projects range from the very rural to the very urban. And so it may be, you remember this project in Vermont, the trail project? Uh, and a farm, uh, a rural Vermont uh, agricultural education center that also had Come desire on. to create yeah. a, so a the trail good to have you uh, for uh, mostly young, young children. Um, we also, you can come to the table there, we, worked, we were asked by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to cite a um, interpretive center at Walden Pond, so also in a rural setting. Oh, the Adirond Adirondack State Park, six million acres, um, both a state park and um, communities living in the state park, so it's not a, something where you draw a boundary and you keep people out. And that was about building communities within a, uh, a site where logging no longer was providing jobs for people, but trying to think of a new sustainable community development strategy. Um, another project in Maine, uh, it's a town that had a, a horrendous fire maybe uh, 70 years ago. They lost their town center and they had multiple small centers, but they, they wondered about having the prospect of having a real focused town center and what that might mean to the town. So they asked us to explore, explore options of where such a town center might happen and what it might look like. Bean Allard. Oh, Bean and Allard Farm, an, an old historical farm in the outskirts of Northampton that also had great conservation qualities. Uh, a stream, a riparian, buffers, and it was coming up for sale and the, 
uh, there were also people in the town who wanted to buy for athletic fields. So the students were dealing with a very dicey political situation where you had a lot of different stakeholders with a lot of conflicting interests. And they worked through the what's the highest and best use for, for this particular site. So uh, two popped up. I'll take the first one, which is Green Burial. And so um, we've had a number of such projects. Uh, this one was from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Watertown, Mass, Mount Auburn Cemetery. But you'll, you'll be hearing about another uh, project just from this year. So people are concerned about sustainability even off into after they're not no longer living on the planet and thinking about the implications and the impact of traditional burial processes where there might be incredible investment in a concrete vault and a, a heart of endangered species hardwood a casket and chemicals in the bodies and all kinds of things. And then this popped up from Hartford. Oh, that's Hartford. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to sure. So in Hart so this is we're getting into the urban end of the projects and so in Hartford, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Hartford and the poorest neighborhoods in the United States, um, we were asked to help understand the, um, the street, recreational, and park implications of um, improving that neighborhood. And there's one more for you. Lowell, oh, it's up here. Lowell, the food, uh, we've done a number of food security plans over the years. And Lowell was last year um, a low-income community um, many Cambodian and Latin American um, immigrants, and it was about how can we grow more food, make food more accessible to more um, of the population or industrial town. So we also, we mostly work in New England and New York, but we work in projects in other states uh, recently, including Arizona and Ohio, but also other countries. So not every year, but from time to time when we have the right, we have a confluence of classmates who speak the la appropriate language and the prospect of a project. So um, we've done three or so projects in Chile, um, a project in uh, Tuscany in Italy, and also in Monterey uh, City in Mexico. A lot of interest in food. I know a number of you have interest in food systems. And so Ken was just mentioning the, the work in Lowell. This is a resident of Lowell who helped us uh, understand how the project might go forward, and other communities around New England and elsewhere including a project for Concord Maps that won an award from the uh, New England American Planning Association. One thing these projects do, and so there are three projects in the year, three major projects, is the major mechanism, um, method of teaching and learning. They cross scales fundamentally. So in the fall, you start with a project that is relatively small, maybe a small cemetery, a small residential situation, a small farm, and so on. Um, and then in the winter, you zoom out dramatically either in scope, geographic scope, and you're working on as much as 6 million acres, or you're working on a more complicated urban situation. In the spring, it's an intermediate scale. It could be a city park, it could be a farm, it could be a number of things, but the, usually the, the extent geographically is intermediate. Also, just as of a couple days ago, we announced our new urban lab or urban collaborative with Holyoke. We signed an agreement with Holyoke Maps, if you're not from the area. Holyoke is a historic, um, Milltown, one of the earliest planned cities in the United States, um, faces some really dramatic uh, challenges, uh, but also has tremendous potential architecturally and socially in so many ways. So we've signed an agreement with them, uh, with the city, to work on uh, focus projects, which have already started um, working on this year, um, but off into, into future years. We've announced two graduate fellows, uh, fellowships for students that be uh, Adrian will tell more about that, but there are $10,000 fellowships for people either from an urban area like Holyoke or interested in working in these kind of places. We'll be extending our, our um, teaching into these areas, conducting workshops and other activities, and um, spreading the word about the potential of these small post-industrial communities. And what we're engaging the community with is the prospect of them hiring our graduates then to continue to work on these projects that we're already doing. So I think hopefully you sense that our mission is both ecological and social, um, and that's that goes they go together for us to define what sustainability is about. Um, we as faculty are here to teach and to learn. We're not researchers. We're not. We don't have other objectives. Um, I'm a trained landscape architect, ecological designer, and conservation planner. Uh, Ken is a writer, and he's our humanities professor. 
And why don't you say just a couple words about the humanities and Paulina? Oh, sure. Uh, it's something that's been with, at the school since the very beginning, the idea that you, um, to be a, uh, an effective landscape designer or planner, you need to think about all aspects of culture and economics and politics and ethics and, and language and to be able to communicate ideas clearly, uh, not just in drawings, but in, in written words and spoken words. So that's, that's been a strong component of the program since uh, it was first begun. And that's a, most design schools don't have that kind of uh, commitment to uh, speaking and writing and dealing with the uh, broader ideas. Um, Kim Ursleff, who's not here today, is a, <coughs> trained both as an architect and a landscape architect, and she practices, and she loves engineering, so she teaches site engineering as well as helping in the studio in the fall and in the spring. John O'Niger, I mentioned earlier, um, he's on leave this year, but he's a permaculturist, and he's learned to train as a conservation biologist. Keith Salzberg um, is in practice as a, design, a land designer, but he teaches primarily in the digital design realm with us. Um, and Bill Luttrell and Glenn Motzkin are two ecologists, so there are, um, there's a field trip every almost every Friday afternoon. Um, we're out in the field looking at things, uh, studying aspects of different ecosystems, as well as a class on Monday morning. We'll go through the weekly uh, rhythm of classes in a minute, but um, you want to say about the visitors? No. Sure. Monday, typically in Monday, late afternoon into the evening, we have a visitor who um, comes talking about projects they've worked on or their professional practice. They can be biologists, uh, designers, planners, scientists of all, all stripes, um, political or community activists. Um, uh, our friend Daryl Morrison comes. Some visitors come more than once, and they do workshops with students. And, and sometimes the visitors are alums to share their experience after leaving Conway and what path uh, they follow. So you have a you have a small cadre of um, regular faculty who are here consistently, and a constant influx of other folks that we're interacting with. Um, if to get more of the stories of alums and what they're doing, we'd encourage you either online you can find a copy of this uh, report, or there are some hard copies here for those that are here. This is a compendium of um, about 30 to 40 years worth of articles from our school magazine that describe the, what alums have done and, and how the school evolved. And there's a, a small a book called Drawing Lessons, which was uh, commissioned for the 40th anniversary of our school a couple of years ago. So in the 40 plus years of the school with no more than 19 students a year, and the range is typically 12 to 19, we have about 600 graduates um, out there in the world, mostly in the United States, but in some other countries, too. So um, here's the rhythm of the year. Oh, we start off, well, we come here for about a day, and then the very next day, we all load into a couple of vans and take off for about a week, um, exploring different places uh, all across that transect that Paul mentioned, from very rural to suburban to urban sites visiting with uh, professional planners or community activists or urban farmers, um, alums, uh, conservation experts, restoration ecologists looking at different project sites, green roofs. Um, we get on a boat and go up, up a river. So it, it's a good opportunity to get to know each other really quickly. If you come back after that, you already are comfortable with each other and it just sets a common experience for the whole year that we can refer back to, but also we're ready to work when we get back. We know each other really well. Eric, do you recognize that ferry? The ferry that operates not far from Adam? I don't know if you want on that little tiny little car ferry? Uh, no, no, actually, I don't recognize that. Should, it's, what is the oldest continuously operating mm -hmm. ferry in North America? Next time you're down there, you should check it out. So on the trip, as Ken's mentioning, we're, we're going to cities, we're going to rural areas, we're looking at a whole range of activities. When we come back, it's time to get ready for the projects. And before the snow flies, we um, we need to get out and onto the sites to learn learn surveying and to create a topographic contour map of a site. So that's an initial kind of activity that um, actually you'll be hearing from Josiah in a few minutes, Josiah Simpson in the back, but that's one of his, he's been helping us with that. Could I just mention that after, as they're learning surveying, they already have their fall project. So as you're learning surveying, you're not learning it in the solely in the abstract, you're learning it and then running over to your fall project site and trying to think, now where, how can I do a survey here, and then you're going back and adding instruction. So that's also in microcosm, much like the, the whole year where 
you're learning something and you're immediately applying it, and then you're immediately going back and asking for help to figure out how you go back and apply it. So our experience has been that this kind of learning is so much more profound and lasting than the traditional, like, have a lecture, take a test, think about applying it in a year or two, like, just immediately jump right into applying it really is uh, powerful. So students are um, out on the sites then, and we're having conversations. Like this was a day of a couple, part of a couple days of conversation, going to every project site and looking with the students, with faculty, at the situation, the real thing, the the real piece of land or water that was there and uh, where it might head. Back in the studio, we're doing a, a range of things, um, interacting, and very collaborative kind of setting instead of like. A competitive setting, like some design schools can become, it's very much supporting each other because we're all learning from each other based on the projects that are underway. And, uh, that fall term is an individual project, so you get help to help serve it in teams. And it, this doesn't culminate in a presentation. About a month before the end of the term, we have a formal presentation in this space. We do that every term. We bring in outside people, an alum, a designer, an ecologist who haven't heard anything about the project before. We've been hearing about it every week because we do presentations to each other every week in this, in this space also. And that's a chance to get to the point where you're drafting recommendations or design suggestions and getting feedback from those outside critics and the clients are here for that as well. Then you have a few more weeks to put it all together, refine, revise, test, and present again. And that's a, also a pretty distinct difference from most design schools where you work all semester, you make a presentation, you're tired, you go home, you forget about it, right? You don't change the product because you don't have time. Whereas here, these are real projects, the clients are paying for this work to be done. This work means something to someone, it has to be useful. And so that's why it's very helpful to have those extra weeks after. So as I mentioned before, we don't get grades. We love that. But you're getting constant feedback. So on a daily basis, you're getting feedback on your work. And that's what we're here to do is focus on that work. Uh, we do have chores. I was mentioning it to someone. So the, we have wood stoves. We, we like to use our wood stoves in the studio and then the rest of the building. So that's one of the chores, bringing in wood. We don't have students chopping wood, but just bringing wood in and getting the fire going. Or we have worm bin. So uh, as you can see, the, this space is a living space as well as a classroom space. People are cooking. Uh, there are scraps. We, someone needs to take the scraps down, make sure the worms are being fed but not overfed. So we all chip in with those chores. Um, graduation is also unique at uh, the comic school. Um, and as a kind of expression of the collaborative learning we have, it's such a, it's a tremendous support that the class has for each of its members. The diplomas are presented by a, a classmate to a, another classmate rather than by faculty or board of trustees or, or such. And it's really, they usually say, and they say a few words or sing a song or write a poem or whatever. They do something to convey something about that other person. It's pretty fantastic. Here's the rhythm of the week. Um, basically, we are partly in this room as a classroom. We're making presentations every Wednesday. Um, so one of the things that when we talk to graduates, say, I learned a lot of fantastic things, but the thing that's really stayed with me is um, ability to make a presentation. After you're, if you're not comfortable speaking, after you do it for 10 months straight, it seems like um, you're ready to stand and talk about ideas that you've given. Friday field trips. So every Friday we're out in the field um, visiting. This is a quaking bog, visiting all kinds of places. Sometimes it's also professional offices, a wide range of things. It's a nice culmination of the week. I'm going to talk about what Annie's cooking. Or I think she's cooking fiddleheads and Japanese knotweed. Wood. Japanese knotweed. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a space that it's a very tight community. Um, very quickly, you learn that you learn so much from each other in the studio and the faculty aren't around in the evening and weekends. And it's also a place where people are cooking and cleaning up and being stressed and <laughs> relaxing as well. It's very home. So, and most of you know that no one lives in the building, but there are people have their own accommodations, which we can help. We help find their list of 40 or more different places. Some people like to live near the school. Some people prefer to live in a town nearby. Um, and then either you live with the, the, the movie theater and the supermarket in town, or you live here with the school and you can meet the other way. 
Sure. So there's a pulse of classes, organized activities, and then um, studio time. Not free time, but studio time. So Monday is a very busy day. There's a class in the morning that Paul teaches on ecological design. And uh, Glenn teaches an, an ecology class, an applied ecology class, thinking about how that those ecological principles apply to projects. We have digital design in the afternoon. Keith teaches that. Uh, the guest speaker, as I mentioned, usually comes in about 4.30, speaks for an hour, hour and a half. A couple of students will prepare a meal for everybody, and the speaker will often stay for that and maybe get enticed to come to the studio and look at your drawings and talk to you about your project. That's probably our longest day of the week in some ways, but it's uh, rich. <laughs> Tuesday, uh, an all-day studio where you might uh, there might be two or three faculty in the, floating in the studio or having team meetings in the winter, uh, somewhat like an, uh, uh, an office model where you're just giving an update on, on where you are, what obstacles are you facing, getting help from faculty to get through that. And also, some of our projects, well, the projects in the fall are nearby, but some of the projects in the other terms might be one or two or three hours away, so that, that oftentimes is a travel day to go collect data or meet with people. Wednesday, studio in the morning, uh, the presentation, in this space in the afternoon, which is a progress report to the faculty and the students, and, and everyone contributes feedback to make suggestions, to say what worked well, what could be improved. Site engineering class with Kim or Kim and Jono in the morning, Thursday in studio in the afternoon. Often those exercises in, the, in site engineering are designed to lead you into working on something similar in your project, so that that those exercises will often go into the studio. Friday morning is the humanities class that I teach, which involves readings, maybe 30 or 40 pages of readings in different disciplines about a topic related to where the students are in their, in their process or in their projects. Some discussion maybe about presentation, about designing a presentation or giving a presentation. Discussion about the ethics of the, the dealing with some issue that's come up in the projects and those kinds of and then typically Friday afternoon, going out in the field with Glenn or Bill, the ecologists, and that could be a visit to a rural site um, to look at a beaver habitat in the winter. It could be visiting an urban site, looking at um, a riverfront restoration project that's in a highly developed urban environment. So earlier I referred to the conventional kind of university teaching model where you have a lecture class, maybe you have a lab, and then you maybe apply it either in school or after school. And you can see that here it's a very different approach. It's very much jumping in the deep end and learning to swim that way, but with you know, a lot of support from faculty and the institution. And you're working with clients who understand the teaching model. So from day one you have a client and you have a project, and um, that is a frame through which all this learning happens and through which you view the, that learning and it really is powerful. Um, one of the things that we really stress that not all design schools these do is a combination of doing things by hand and doing them digitally. So for example, we stress field sketching and sketching in general, but also 3D modeling through SketchUp and other tools like that. We do hand-drawn maps, especially in the fall, but we also teach how to use a geographic information system. We stress graphic design in a traditional mode, but also desktop publishing. Hand rendering, how to make a drawing by hand, but also how do you use Photoshop to simulate and otherwise represent projects, and at least some introduction to computer-aided design. So we feel that uh, the range of kind of projects that our alums want to work on, they need this balance of, of skills. And the thing to realize is that in 10 months, no one's really going to become an expert in all of these or any of these necessarily. It's really just how to, the school is structured around giving people enough of a beginning so they can continue a life of learning, a lifetime of learning, um, and that's the best teacher. Yeah. How much background do you need to have in any of one of those before you come here? You know what? It's interesting is that people have backgrounds in all kinds of different things. And so what we're trying to do is put together a team of people who um, some have a background in GS, some have a background in whatever, some have more life experience. Mm -hmm. So it's more about what is your, what are you driven by? What is your mission in life? And are you ready to learn, take these on? 
some people don't have the background in any of these, mm -hmm. and so sometimes we suggest some very targeted kind of preparation to do before you come. But everyone has something to learn. Everyone has something to contribute. So after Conway, we the school facilitates a, a range of, of ways to transition to work, including very much one-on-one -on -one consulting with you about where do you want to live, what kind of work do you want to do. But we also offer a um, annual fellowship that has sent uh, our graduates to Malaysia and Bali and India most recently and Panama and other places. Um, most recently, we've just signed our first agreement uh, with uh, an alum of our school. She's pictured on the left, um, Luann Erfer in Alaska, and her firm, Sustainable Design Group. So they're committing to a six-month paid internship or apprenticeship is what we're calling it. Um, it will further allow graduates to apply their what they've learned here and further develop their, their technical skills. And our goal for this year is, is to have six of these positions um, available for this year's class and then to build on that, and evaluate and build on it into the future. If you pick up our magazine or look at it online, you can see um, a wide range of things that alums are doing and the other activities of the school, as well as the, the not just the magazine, but our project um, reports and plan sets. Are, most of them are on, on the website. So final slide before we go to Q&A is um, the first Q&A. Um, if you're thinking about a school like this, you might be the right place for you. If you like to look at the whole system at one time, you don't like to sort of separate out one little piece and stay there. You like to take a piece, look at it, then think about how the big pieces go together. If you like to learn by doing, like you really, rather than hearing and, and, and theoret thinking theoretically about things alone, like, but you like to really jump in and learn by doing, this is a school where that's emphasized. If you like to collaborate, if you like to work with other people as opposed to going off into a shed somewhere and just sort of being on your own, if you like that interaction, if you thrive on that, this is a place where that's definitely emphasized. And, and this notion of jumping in the deep end and being very concentrated. Sometimes we talk about the 10 months of Conway are really equal to at least maybe two years in the rest of the world, right? You, because of what you learn and how it's structured. By the way, it's not a school you can go to part-time. And it's not a school you can work part-time on the side. It's a full, full commitment for the 10 months. Um, and also, our emphasis is less about trying to emulate what happened in the past. We want to understand the past, but it's about designing for now and into the future with food insecurity, climate change, destabilization, a whole range of opportunities out there. We want to be designing for that without you. And then um, it's really a proven after 40 plus years is a proven one of a kind kind of academic experience. So that's our overview. And so we can take questions from here, and you're going to check on any online questions too. Yeah. So let me start with the <coughs> audience here. If you have any questions, yeah, Lori. I, I want to get a better idea of the day, how long the day is an hour. Yeah. And... So except Monday is the longest day, as Ken mentioned, but otherwise it's sort of it's we're we're interacting nine to five basically, um, but students in the room like Trevor. Some people stay. You're one that stays into the evening, right? Other people go home to family. So for wide range. Yeah, there's just a wide range of. Um, Sort of like personal life situations. I um, moved here from Virginia. I'm living by myself, and I'm comfortable working here. So I'll often stay here with a small group of students, between seven or eight, sometimes working. Some people are up to five and work. But it's typically eight thirty-ish to five, five thirty, and then of course um, there are Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons are kind of flexible and different to do what you need to do. Yeah, and then Monday's the night when we have the speaker and the dinner and. Yeah. Uh, six thirty-seven. Six or seven. Seven, maybe. maybe people are approved by seven. And is that something that's required? It is. It's very much part of the learning. What's going on? Other questions? Yeah. I'm curious about the process of students connecting with clients, whether yeah. clients approach you, the school, or how that happens. Yeah. Them. So maybe Dave, who actually gets the projects, could touch on that. And will will everyone be able to hear Dave, or should he come up here? Um, yeah. Project. Okay, come project, up here. Dave. So then, <laughs> no, Dave, come up here. Then they can see you. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Get their so money's worth. <laughs> you are. So Dave, of course, is the administrative director. He has lots of responsibilities, including getting the projects. Right. So the question was, how do we get uh, projects? And how do we uh, pick, I guess also the question was, how do we get students to get a particular project team? So the projects we get come in a variety of different ways. Uh, oftentimes, uh, somebody contacting the school, they've heard about us in the past, and maybe a prior class.
client and they call up and say, hey, I think I've got, I've got a great idea for a project. Why don't we talk about it? It may also be, like Paul was mentioned earlier with the Urban Lab Initiative in Polio, uh, we are sort of targeting uh, urban areas right now, in particular in the Knowledge Corridor up and down the Connecticut River Valley. Um, we know we want to work on those types of projects, so we're in touch with uh, you know, city planners and those types of folks to try to arrange those projects. Um, and sometimes it's cold calling. I mean, it's just a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and then when the uh, student projects or the student teams are assigned to the projects, um, that's also, uh, well, Ken actually does quite a bit of work on that. Um, basically, what we do is we uh, announce the projects to the students before the beginning of each term, we give them about a one page summary of what we think the projects are about. Then the students have a chance to weigh in, rank order the projects they're interested in. Uh, we also allow them to choose one student they really want to work with. One they'd rather not if they if they really don't want to, um, and then uh, that information is taken along with a whole lot of input from the faculty uh, to actually design those those teams that work on those team projects. So the goal is to get the students who are the most passionate uh, to be working on a project and also efficient because they can work together with with their project partner. So the cold calls that they mentioned are because we know there's an important topic out there and maybe no one's asking us to think about green burial, about certain aspects of stormwater management or whatever. So we seek out people. We want to make sure that our projects are on the cutting edge of practice so that our graduates can go out. Like when we did a green, our first green burial project, the, one of the students on that team then went out and was, in essence, one of the foremost designers of green burial because other people haven't been doing it. So she was able to do a professional project in short order after that. The thing you might be wondering about the projects is that um, how much do you have to pay? Like if you have a project in Chile or wherever. So basically the clients are paying to subsidize the projects. And so the expenses of production of documents, travel, whenever is covered by the clients. So the students don't pay. Other questions or comments? We have one from our online yeah. audience here. Okay. Um, interesting question. The projects presented are very practical. Are there opportunities for exploring the abstract and fantastical side of design? Yeah. Okay. You want to take that? You want to okay. <laughs> so yes, there are opportunities. And we, we think of the design process as starting with a very wide casting of the net. So the opportunity early on is to say, even sometimes before you've met the client and started that process of down the path of creating a product for them. What they need is the, someone to think about the fantastic and the, the wide range. But the difference between our school and others is that at some point it has to come back. The rubber has to meet the road. It has to come back to specific needs. And we found that to be the best design tool for teaching that there is. It doesn't mean that later our graduates are strictly very pragmatic without being visionary, because our graduates are very, very visionary. One we were just in touch with, her name is Clarissa Rowe, she's based in Boston. If you're from the Boston area or ever heard of the Harbor Islands, there's one called Spectacle Island. When the big dig was underway, which was to, um, to put into the ground a major elevated uh, interstate highway, they had to put the, the land, the earth they were digging up somewhere, and it was her design of how then to, to take that earth and to use it on Spectacle Island and create a park from it. So it required incredible vision. I think the most visionary thing that's needed today in the world is, uh, we talk about new ecologies. It's incredibly visionary to design something that's forward-looking. And so, yeah, it's practical, but it's forward-looking because it's not like something that's happened before. And so it's very, it seems to me very much, uh, it's engaging and uh, requires a kind of vision that, that isn't um, just pragmatic. And if it's, if it's outside of... They're, especially in the community projects, if you propose something that's so far beyond what they're comf comfortable with, it's going to be a dead end. The project's not going to go anywhere. But if it's something that can be culturally sustained, it's, uh, culturally, it's, it's, it's valued by that community and they can see it valuable, then it's more likely to continue. Because uh, the projects are always about where are they and how can it move forward rather than that you're the beginning and the end of anything. So, other questions in the room or online? Let's have a question. This be some other opportunities as we go, but if we had anyone, anyway, we'll wrap by. That's all right. Tuition. Tuition. Yeah. 
So we'll mostly touch that in the end, but there is tuition. It's $31,450. And maybe we'll talk about the fellowships and grants that we have. And uh, he and Dave can talk about the other various sources of funding that we saw down. Yeah. I think you said part of your background is as a landscape architect. Architect, right, right. Right. Do you find that your graduates, since uh, since they have basically what is a new type of degree, and they go in all types of directions, do they sometimes find spaces, perhaps like there, where maybe there are certain things they can't do or are limited in doing? Um, no, actually, comic grads can do everything, and no. <laughs> um, right. And so there's a variety of ways. Some become landscape architects. Some do that by uh, and, and entering into a master of landscape architecture program. Those typically are three years for people without previous design training. Our students can typically do that in two years. So we have set a specific agreement with the University of Massachusetts Amherst, also with the University of Georgia. But our students go to other schools. We had several that graduated or are about to graduate from Cornell and other schools. So that's one route. Other alums have gone into, uh, they were hired in a practice that included landscape architects. And if you work under a landscape architect for the right number of years, which varies from state to state, then you can sit for the exam. And, and so Clarissa Rowe, I would want to mention, she, she left here. She went into practice. She had, did no further study before becoming a landscape architect. She just worked in an office setting. Um, people have a lot to learn when they leave here, and they circa, you were mentioning some of the certificates you've been working on. Many of them seek out, I mean, like Elaine Williamson did the wetland delineation certification. They do GIS work. They do all kinds of things. Did you do CAD? Yeah. So AutoCAD. So it's like this is a, a grounding and an exposure to a process of design and a, and a taste of a lot of things. And then you get a sense of where you want to go, and then you say, what else do I need? We mentioned Wendy Goldsmith, who has multiple offices now around the country. She went to Germany and worked with one of the foremost experts in storm water. So everyone seeks out a path. We offer a lot of advice. But um, no, you can't learn everything here. But you are getting exposed to important ideas, and you're learning a, a, a way of thinking about solving problems that we haven't worked on before when we're like, you're here at school, and you won't. Other questions? Or? Okay, should we go on? Yes. And what's next? The next step is going to be our presentation from our two current students. Okay. So this is Trevor Buckley and Marie, how do you pronounce your last name? Akirolo. Akirolo. And do you have a little bit of okay, that running? They're going to talk a little bit about their projects completed in the fall, current projects, and life of come. And we will do a Q and A um, just for them afterwards. Got another question here. Thanks for the question, Julian. We'll get to that at some point. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Go ahead. Sure. Oh, sorry, presentation. Okay. But, say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was just going to say, Marie and I met at uh, formal presentations a year and a half ago, and. So I was really excited about she was going to be here this year. I mean, we've become really great friends um, over the course of the year. And I understand the presentation. We did our fall surveying together. Um, so we decided to do our presentation together, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here it comes. Do you need to drive? Let's do it. No. Okay. Cool. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Great. So. We prepared a presentation on life as a Conway student, and we'll take you through our personal experience of some of the things that um, Paul and Ken and Dave just uh, mentioned. So we just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we were doing before we got here. Um, I managed a small town farmers market and worked on two family-owned organic farms um, in Richmond, the area of Richmond, Virginia, um, where I came here. And I graduated from undergraduate in 2009, so I majored in geology and studied environmental science as well. Um, but was ready for a break from academia and ready to go out there and um, work outside, work with my hands. So I got into agriculture and also did some work in uh, landscape design, installing and maintaining green roofs, living walls, and native plant landscapes. Um, and I, we talked a little bit, there's a question about uh, backgrounds. I have a pretty different background than Trevor as far as my schooling. I had a, I got my bachelor's degree in religious studies and then spent a lot of time 
um, after school working in human services, um, working with adults with developmental disabilities. At some point during that time, I took a break and lived at Twin Oaks Community, which is an intentional community farm uh, in central Virginia, um, so not far from Richmond. And uh, there I first started um, getting really excited about sustainable agriculture and permaculture. And um, uh, then I moved to uh, Pittsburgh and uh, Pennsylvania, and that's where I spent the last few years of my um, of my life, and there I really started to feel like, oh, I, this is would be, and I started to get interested in um, integrating some of the sustainable farming um, and permaculture things that I learned in urban environments. Um, and I learned about the Conway School and thought this seems like the right place to, to come. So um, again, as Ken and Paul uh, talked about the, the orientation field trip um, is pretty exciting. Some of the things that I felt like were most important in that trip, um, besides really uh, getting to know classmates um, extremely well and quickly um, and intimately, um, were the, the, the skill of just um, recognizing patterns and um, uh, looking at the world around us with uh, a different eye. So one of the places we went was a, a forest that um, has been uh, devastated by Hemlock uh, Woolly Adelgid. Um, and so just talking about um, how to deal with disturbances um, in that setting. Um, we looked at uh, uh, salt marsh uh, restoration off the Cape, um, which is a, you know, a completely different environment than Hemlock Forest. So that was also, and being from Pennsylvania, I'd never seen a salt marsh before. So that was, that was pretty, uh, a pretty interesting experience. We had uh, an educational and fun experience on the Connecticut River um, trip. And uh, we also visited the Harvard Forest, which is a, a research uh, forest uh, in uh, uh, Peter Sam, thanks. Um, and spent a lot of time talking about uh, forest succession and some of the things that they're doing there. And. Um, as soon as we got back from about a week on the road, um, we hit the ground running for the projects. We got our project assignments, and we were split into surveying teams, as was discussed. So we um, learned how to use uh, transit, and Maria and I were actually in the same group. So everybody has their independent project, but you go to all of their sites to help survey as a team. So here we are at our teammate Michelle Carlson's uh, project site, which was a rural cemetery not too far from Conway. There I am with the studio rod in the background, <laughs> and we behind the Transit station. <laughs> Teammate Liz and I um, completely baked after a long day of surveying out in the field. <laughs> and so um, at the end of that intense week, we um, bring all that data uh, uh, back into the studio and plug it into the computer and we start creating base maps. Um, so I was here to help us with that um, back in the fall. And you're going to spend a lot of time in the studio from there on out. There's a picture of my desk, one late night, um, completely covered with papers and maps and sketches and photographs and computer. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my project. Uh, I worked on a cemetery design and uh, landscape management plan for Mount Cemetery, which is in Chesterfield, Massachusetts, about uh, 30 minutes from here. And I uh, was working with the town specifically, their superintendent of cemeteries and the chair of the cemetery commission. And um, they actually approached the Conway School. Um, to see if we will be interested in a project. And they had um, some specific concerns and also saw some potential in this um, site. So Mount Cemetery is one of many uh, historic cemeteries in the town, 215 years old. Um, it's a historic treasure, but they're having some uh, challenges with um, keeping up with the landscape maintenance. So they wanted to look at how to create a lower maintenance landscape. They had areas that were um, missing walls or fences around the cemetery, so they wanted to complete visual enclosure. They were interested in adding some particular gathering garden spaces to the site, uh, where people were there for ceremonies or visiting. And they also had two woodland lots uh, that are located behind uh, the existing cemetery. And there's a growing movement um, nationwide and um, strong interest here in western Massachusetts in uh, developing designated green burial sites. And so um, uh, my client thought, that uh, this site um, might be uh, particularly adept to it. Um, 
the uh, wooden lots in the back of the cemetery. Um, we could talk more about green burial later if you're interested. I just put an infographic up here um, from the U.S. Green Burial Council. Um, Michelle uh, and I, Michelle, classmate who also worked on a green burial project, Ireland Street Cemetery. Um, we had read about green burial and knew a little bit about it, um, so we're excited to get the projects. Um, but we, little did we, uh, we knew very little about the um, environmental consequences of conventional burial practices as well as cremation um, in the U.S., which this infographic is displaying. So as we learn throughout our projects over the fall, through a lot of conversations with people who are working in the green burial movement, as well as with landscape architects, there really is a, a lot of um, potential for uh, designers in various fields to engage the um, uh, funeral industry um, and, and uh, owners of cemeteries in um, both practicing more sustainable burial practices and uh, more ecologically conscientious management of cemetery landscapes. Green burial, just in case you don't know, it uh, typically involves um, burial bodies without the use of embalming, uh, concrete vaults, uh, or even coffins, and as well as um, more sustainable um, landscape maintenance practices. So at my site, uh, this is what most of the site looks like, very conventional cemetery with uh, graves in a rectilinear fashion, but they had these two woodland lots located uh, behind um, the existing cemetery that they were interested in developing. So there, was, there were a lot of questions to consider about how this might be done um, practically and in a way that would work with the, um, the current vegetation, or how we might go about changing it um, in an ecological restoration sense, and what that would all look like. So that kind of drove a lot of that part of um, the project that I worked on. Um, over on the left, you can uh, see the bullet point list of kind of the process that we typically go through. Um, probably we'll talk more about today, but you establish project goals with the client, do a series of um, different analyses, and um, we're pushed very hard not to just make observations, um, but to really dig into what is the significance of those observations um, and allow that to uh, really drive the design. I put up some images from my project of slopes and drainage analysis that I did um, for the cemetery site. Um, typically, um, most students will, will uh, do that analysis as well as take an inventory of uh, vegetation do a sun shade analysis and um, look at the soil survey um, and conduct some soil tests um, at their sites. And after we've done a serious analysis, and that, that takes up the better part of September and October, we really spent a lot of time uh, working on analysis and hold off on design uh, until about the beginning of November. And um, this year we had Daryl Morrison come in, um, a designer that was mentioned earlier. He, sort of was like, his workshop was like our kickoff session um, to begin um, the actual execution design. So here's just a little series of some of my design work, starting really schematic, really sketchy, fun stuff, just going kind of crazy in the studio one night. Um, we develop alternatives, which are typically presented at the fall formal presentations, which um, I believe Ken was discussing. Um, I, they aren't like um, final presentations. They're actually a month or so out from um, end of the project, but we we share those with the client and with guest critics, and then from there on out, we work towards typically one final sign. Some people um, just work on nesting their design alternatives. So the the project that I worked on in the fall uh, was working with a, a nonprofit that runs a farm in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Or how many folks are from? Uh, Massachusetts. Okay, great. So it's um, just recently Greenfield Community Farm, and um, one of the things that uh, that I through the process that I found really um, interesting that happens uh, sometimes with projects at the Conway School. Sometimes you, you know, David mentioned that uh, when projects are selected, that there's a uh, sort of an abstract of what we believe the project is about at the beginning, um, and then sometimes that changes when. Um, first learned about this project, it was initially about uh, creating, the, the client wanted uh, of a, a trail, um, a, a edible uh, food forest trail through um, sort of a woodland area, um, which was exciting. Um, and through the course of the project, um, I found it changed. Um, so the project goals that uh, we 
established that I established with the client were um, kind of looking at the farm um, and their practices, their uses of the public space and private space, um, figuring out ways to connect them that's efficient. Um, there, uh, there's a, there was a, a pretty big conflict of a uh, road that bisected the property and the traffic, uh, the vehicular traffic that travels through the property was sometimes um, posed a pretty serious safety concern to pedestrians. So part of the project was addressing the access and circulation on the site to figure out ways that pedestrians could uh, navigate the space safely. Um, and then they also are interested in having community gatherings. They have a couple of festivals each year, so, um, but um, not adequate space to, to sort of have those gathering those gatherings, so um, we had conversations about how to develop welcoming gathering spaces. Uh, they also are a working farm, and um, they have four and a half acres of a market garden, so they uh, were, um, uh, we were, part of the project was also about helping them uh, efficiently um, find ways to, uh, to wash their vegetables that allow for effective water infiltration. Um, and uh, also to uh, talk about some a solar array that could um, reduce their uh, fossil fuel uh, generated electricity. Um, so the um, this is just a, kind of an aerial shot to show that one thing, some of the things that we do at the Conway School are uh, again really thinking about the context of the design and not not just the the actual site and the location. So uh, this was a, <laughs> a picture that in the, in the studio last fall that I had um, uh, kind of up, <laughs> that I was looking at because it was constantly reminding me of the important components of the context that were in conflict with each other, the road and the traffic, um, an area that was being used um, as a dumping site, and then some potentially fragile areas like um, riparian buffers and a uh, stream in the river. Um, so again, this picture illustrates the food forest trail that originally the project was about. Um, I quickly discovered might not be possible. So we, we had to sort of work around um, figuring out how to address um, the disturbance that was created um, during a storm that, that toppled a lot of trees um, before I actually met with the clients, but after uh, the Congress had agreed uh, at the contract with them. So um, the final design that I worked uh, on in conjunction with a client aimed to address uh, a lot of the, those issues that I talked about, helping to uh, create uh, an idea for a gathering space, um, looking at uh, where some of the fragile areas are located and, and navigating a trail system through the fallen trees, some areas that uh, may or may not be wetlands that uh, need to be identified, um, and it was uh, it was a, it was a pretty it was a pretty great process. Um, I feel like working through that that site analysis that Trevor talked about, and and then um, just really allowing things to um, come together. It's um, you know there there was a period when you're in the fall when you're, you're doing site analysis, and um, there were definitely times that I felt like what <laughs> like when is it like is magic just going to happen at some point and things will sort of come together. Um, and uh, the faculty, you know, would say like, you know, just hold on, things will like start to make sense. And I wanted to, you know, there were times that I felt like I wanted to get to an answer. And, and there really, there really is the way that the process works. There really is kind of a way that um, things started to make sense um, through the analysis. We wanted to touch on our uh, winter projects. We um, were just broke up into our teams about three weeks ago, um, so we're still sort of delving in and um, getting to know much more about um, the communities that we're working with during this uh, regional planning term. Um, but uh, we want to share what we know thus far. And I'm uh, working on a project with a partner down in uh, the lower Connecticut River Valley. Um, our client is a regional planning agency that represents 17 towns. They work mainly on transportation um, issues. Uh, and they. Um, they came to the Conway School via uh, an alum who lives in the area who was aware that there is a nine-mile stretch of unused rail corridor that's owned by the state. 
um, that has uh, been unused since the late uh, 1960s. And so uh, the uh, River Cog, the planning agency, thought this might be a great potential site for a multimodal trail um, that um, would include a pedestrian and bicycling path, perhaps more. And they're really interested in this because their economy is largely driven by um, cultural attractions and um, recreation and a greenway that they're developing. Um, and they thought it also might improve uh, local transit for residents that live in the vicinity of the rail corridor. Uh, so this is the study area. It's in the, as I said, the lower Connecticut River Valley down near the Long Island Sound. We're working mostly in the town of Allen. It's right about here. So the rail corridor is actually, we're working on a section of a 22.7 mile rail corridor that we're going to be studying an area that's towards the northern end of that. And so zoomed in, the rail corridor is right along the river um, and close to several village centers. So in great proximity, um, but there's definitely going to be issues to consider given the proximity to the river and several streams and wetlands. Um, as I said, tourism is really important on the lower part of the uh, rail system. They, uh, there's a company that runs um, a steam locomotive, like tourist, um, tourist trips, and uh, as well as a steamboat. So um, this project will um, include, um, well, include looking to connect the potential rail trail to many of these other area attractions. So our project uh, report specifically is going to address connections from the trail to villages, um, recreational facilities, and existing trails in the area. We're going to have conceptual designs and design guidelines. Of course, we can't do every single uh, mile of the track, uh, so we're going to sort of pull out um, model areas or, or areas of particular interest on the track and flush those out for the client, as well as uh, provide rough cost estimates for elements of the trail that include upgrading bridges, um, uh, addressing bridges or uh, connections over wetland areas. There's several private residences um, with um, uh, driveways and paths that cross the current corridor, and there's a lot of homes right nearby. So we to address all those issues in our um, design. And of course, we haven't worked on the design yet. We're just doing analysis. But I uh, popped some in images in here for you to give you an idea of some of the things that Christian, my partner, and I will um, probably be including in our report. Uh, you know, um, plans and um, schematic diagrams of what um, road crossings, safe road crossings might look like, uh, sections of what the elements of a uh, multimodal trail would include, um, and perhaps photo simulations. I pulled this one from the web, which is kind of cool, um, showing um, an abandoned rail and then what it might look like after um, uh, the tra trail has been paved and all has been added. And um, signage and such. And um, one thing I wanted to um, say about the regional planning term, um, Paul talked about this with us the very first week, is that um, it's a little bit of a different process um, than the ball site design term. There's definitely elements of the design process that we draw on, but it's maybe perhaps a little bit less linear in structure. And um, the reason for that is that often have, um, you'll have a client, for instance, we're working with this planning agency, but um, we have two contacts with the planning agency. We have several other planners who are in on the project and involved with their various ends. There's also a lot of stakeholders. Obviously, it would be affected by this project. And so while we um, are going to be doing analysis like we did in the fall um, that includes um, environmental inventory, looking at land use in the area, the existing transportation infrastructure, and the needs of the community, and I'm showing you some um, images of GIS maps that we've started to develop of our study area. That's a tool that we'll largely be using to do those analyses. A requirement of this term is that we also conduct community meetings. So there's going to be a lot of interaction with community members um, through formal and informal interviews. We have two official meetings. One that um, is described by the faculty as sort of scoping meeting. Uh, Christian and I will be going down to meet with um, about 15 stakeholders next Thursday that include um, people in the community who are very like pro rail trail, others who are more interested in redeveloping the rail system um, for trains, um, some representing um, local government, um, the Chamber of Commerce, so on and so forth. And then we'll be working over the course of a month to come up with um, some of our uh, conceptual designs and design guidelines, and then we'll report back at a larger meeting open to the public. And then after that, we will be for synthesizing all of that 
um, to foment a, a vision for the community. Um, and then um, we will be going to the stakeholders and our clients for a review and revision. Okay. So I'm working with two classmates uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts, which uh, is exciting for me coming from Pittsburgh. It's the uh, fourth largest city in New England. Um, and we are uh, working with the Urban Agriculture Committee of Springfield to assess vacant lands uh, within the city that could be available for urban agriculture. <coughs> um, so there, um, you know, we talked a little bit about some, there have been food security projects um, and there are a variety um, on the table that you can look at later um, done by past students. The um, Springfield has done um, a lot of work already in uh, assessing the need for an increase in, in food security there. There have been uh, several community studies that have shown, that have identified specific food deserts um, where people don't have um, access to uh, nutritious food, um, easy access. And so there are several committees, lots of nonprofit organizations, there's already a whole lot of momentum in Springfield. Um, so what's what we believe at this point our project is about um, is that we really need to kind of create an inventory and start cataloging um, the available land within the city using a, kind of a variety of different criteria um, based on site conditions, um, zoning regulations, um, you know, what land is abutting that, uh, what, and uh, so then we will be uh, generating some uh, recommendations to uh, the Urban Agriculture uh, Committee so that they can uh, use this information in, um, to potentially make changes to um, zoning if that needs to happen or in policy making within the city um, to really revitalize the city using um, urban agriculture, which is something that they're um, working towards. Um, and That's it for our winter products, but um, if we have time, we wanted to just tell you a little bit about um, class during the week. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Kenneth Paul said Friday afternoons we we go on field trips, um, and so we have just a couple of pictures of um, places, things that we've done learning in the field. So this uh, picture shows. Uh, so this is Keith, actually, um, uh, we're at the Greenfield Community College, uh, learning how to calculate roof um, rainwater runoff. Um, and then we are at um, Conway alum and master teacher Dave Jackie's house. He's a permaculturist, and um, this is a place that Ramon view. We went there for a session, and I did a, a three-hour permaculture intensive. I'm sure you'll be hearing more about him in Conway. Um, this uh, was an exercise out in the Montague Plains with Glenn Botskin. Uh, we, we talk a lot about soil. Um, uh, earlier in the fall, actually, we had uh, Al Averill come in um, as a soil scientist and to, to in the beginning of talking about soil structure. But this day was really interesting because we actually got to dig soil pits and then um, come up with a story of what, uh, explaining what we're seeing in, um, in the soil structure. Um, and then we kind of did a little report back at the end and, and found that some of our some of our stories were accurate, some of them weren't. But um, it was you know it was it was a really it was a really um, helpful exercise to actually dig the soil pits and then make the observations and come up with some hypotheses about what we were about the observations that we were making. Yeah, I'd say our Friday field sessions with uh, Glenn as well as Bill, who I think is in the next slide, are really awesome because you know we weren't just going out there. And digging a soil pit and you know, using the key that we had to identify it, and then like just turning in a worksheet or a lab or something. Um, Glenn and Bill are just tremendously engaging and really trying to help us to connect to everything that um, we're learning. Um, say like in a Monday morning class doing ecological design, Glenn teaches um, half of those sessions along with Paul, um, and, and he's just a terrific. A great teacher, so um, there's a lot of discussion involved, but they allow us to sort of uh, uh, you know, complete the exercises and then sort of develop our own thoughts and ideas. Like Marie said, 
really discuss it and you know, they patiently listen and kind of help us to um, really think through what we're um, saying before maybe revealing the answers or what they know. Hopefully I have some more pictures of this. Yeah, and scenic surroundings and yeah. life here in Conway vicinity. <laughs> this is on Mount Sugarloaf. This was on another field trip where we were talking about but, the Connecticut Herb Valley and um, bedrock geology. This was uh, last week. Yeah. Um, right before last out with Bill, which I can't really see him, but he's the guy right there, uh, one of our other Friday field ecologists, and we were. Um, we were supposed to go over to where he lives in Heath, but it was like 20 below that day. Mm -hmm. um, the second one of these polar vortex blasts <laughs> that have affected us. Um, so he came over here where it was slightly warmer, like 10 degrees. He so. <laughs> looked really warm. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, I was like this, peeled over, um, and I think Bill was wearing like a t-shirt. <laughs> what did you um, actually see, though? Mm -hmm. What kind of tracks? We, yeah, it was awesome. I mean, we walked out the trail maybe 40, 50 feet, and Bill stopped, saw something, and it wasn't just like, we, we had like a little session here in the classroom um, for about an hour or so before we went out, um, where he explained sort of the process for identifying tracks and gave us some examples. But um, he had us examine what we saw and sort of come up with some ideas, and it wasn't just that here's a series of tracks, there's like a whole story embedded in the snow there. Um, I mean, following <laughs> the tracks you know, several hundred yards out into the woods and trying to um, figure out what happened. So it was a tell the story. Well, I was going to—I was just going to add about the story. Yeah. It's—it's. It's, it was another one of those exercises where um, what we're learning, what you observe, is is a part of a larger story that's taking place. So one of the things that that um. Bill was talking, uh, was discussing with us as we as we were seeing tracks and um, explaining that you know, based on how far apart they were, you know, what line they were in, and then just what tracks they were, that there was he that he later after we had some ideas, that we generated some ideas about what we were seeing, told us the story of what he believed actually happened between the animals that, that we saw, you know, and, and sort of like told the story of like, well, first there. You know, there was a, this is a, these are gray fox tracks, it's a, a tracks and um, gray fox you know, came by. Yeah, gray fox came by, was being tailed by two coyotes, and you could see the coyote tracks split. And so, you know, he just told the whole story about what probably happened. Um, uh, and yeah, that was. Yeah, we we so we we followed as far as we could, and then I guess zooming out um, into a much larger regional. Ecological context, and, and to, to drive home the point about why these Friday field sessions may be so important, is we end up having a whole discussion about how, you know, at one point coyotes had been really extirpated from the east, and then how they made their way back to um, uh, the northeastern United States, and um, their behavior patterns, and then how there may even be a link uh, based on some recent research between the increase in Lyme disease because of um, the influx of coyotes, and it has something to do with um, the, the main mice that are vectors for Lyme disease um, being controlled by fox, but now that coyotes are crowding a fox, they have much more mice, and therefore they increase the rate of Lyme disease. So um, there's so much more <laughs> in the story than just tracks in the snap. Right? I'm sorry, what's that? Uh, wolves and mountain lions. Yeah. But they were they were largely hunted yeah. and driven out just like wolves and bears and a lot of the other megafauna. Yeah. Okay. Any questions either about the projects or the experiences? Um, <laughs> the soil pits that you were digging is in the studying the soil structure. Um, do you to the in, one of the teachers, do you do that similar exercise each year so that every class learns soil structure and geology a little bit? Yeah, so we're after the basic kind of things are repeated every year. So we're always finding new and interesting people to invite. So we have new, also every year there's something new. But it's a combination of, well, we better make sure that 
they see a soil pit and experience that. Mm -hmm. But uh, how it happens or who does it may vary. Other questions? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess it would be too soon for your projects, but do you know that some of most of them implemented to pay for them, or like do you know, how often is the project actually implemented? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. um, it depends on the scale of the project, how you think about implementation. So um, when we're working on a planning project um, currently, it, there, the project may be intended to move a, a community farther along so that they can then have subsequent meetings so that they can build something else beyond the extent of what we do in 12 weeks. So that's an implementation. Um, in terms of a residential design, um, we, we find that some designs are implemented so um, we, we don't we don't have a division of research that um, can follow up every project and find out five years later what what happened. So that would be a wonderful thing. So implementation takes many forms. That's a good yeah. So I mean, there, every once in a while, there's a project like we did a project for an organization called Women Together in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. It was a, a group of people who had been affected by. Um, gang violence, mostly mothers who lost children to gang violence, and they, they identified a vacant lot and thought it could be a great park. They thought of it as an intergenerational gathering spot, and it was the right project at the right time. They hired us to develop the design within, um, uh, let's see how many months, within 18 months of the start of that project, it was actually built. It went from our project, uh, our student work, to engineering firm, final engineering, to construction. Uh, so every once in a while, it, it, it just takes, it catches fire like that. But uh, more often, it's informing other decisions. It's used to raise money. It's used to move things forward. And really, the thing about design and planning, a lot of the work professionally is that, and that those are all important steps. What are other questions for the students about their experiences? Maybe for Jessica. Um, do you feel like the work that you were doing before you applied to the school and came here? Prepared you well for the for your education here, and I guess likewise, is there anything that you wish that you knew a little bit more about, or you know, took a class or whatnot that would aid your education? <laughs> Man, uh, sorry. Yeah, I kind of breezed over that when I was introducing myself. Breezed over our job, but uh, I um, I found out about Conway through a permaculture. Course that I took with Dave Dackey uh, almost four years ago, and um, he, I loved the course that I took, and he explained that his whole methodology and the design process for teaching there came from his experience here at Conway, and it really spoke to me because it just integrated so many of my different interests. I've always felt like I was one of those people who's wanted to be more of a generalist and just had a hard time just focusing on one thing so narrowly. Um, but as much as I was enjoying working on farms, working in agriculture and, and landscaping, I somehow wanted to draw together um, what I enjoyed most about those activities with my academic ground as an undergraduate and um, my love for um, geology and nat the natural sciences and field work and all that. So, um, so I feel like everything is sort of around full circle or been melded together here in a way. So, and everybody's got unique experiences, which is a great part of, it, of coming here too, and, and um, drawing on everybody's varied experiences. So I'm just one example of that, but I feel like that definitely informs it. And, um, you know, having um, having solid research skills and communi communication skills can help you from the start, but you also will work on those again here. And some people have been maybe out of the academic realm for a while. So um, it's a great, time, a great time to continue building those skills. I would say if there were any, anything, um, there was anything that I wish I had worked on more, is uh, it was only in things that the school told us and encouraged us to prepare before we got here, which I did a little bit of. But I was also working full time and taking some classes and doing certifications. So it's kind of hard to squeeze all in. But you know, if you decide you here and you're accepted, then then need their advice and do it, <laughs> do as much. Just um, just enjoy yourself, but you know practice as much drawing as you can. Uh, work with uh, digital design software with any of the 
Adobe products that we'll be using here, like InDesign, Photoshop, Illustrator. If you're just playing around with AutoCAD, if you're able to get access to RTIS, um, then maybe explore that or take it over the summer before you arrive. So then you can maybe just hit the ground running a lot of this. We're starting from scratch or stamp yeah. college. I think it really depends on what your comfortable, like what your comfortability is within all of these areas. When I ask that question to students in this position, um, the year that that we met and visited, almost everyone said, "Learn Adobe InDesign. It's um, cha it's challenging. It's a challenging program." I my experience actually was that for me personally, InDesign was not the thing that was the hardest. I um, not having um, having less of a like uh, background grounded in like science and um, art, I actually felt that for me, I wish I had done a little bit, I'd done more reading <laughs> that's on the reading list, um, the suggested reading list, I wish I had done a little bit more of that and I wish I had um, done a little bit more drawing just to get comfortable um, looking at something and then transferring it, you know, what I'm seeing onto paper. Um, but again, like it, at this point, you know, I, I you learn so much. You learn so much um, in such a short amount of time that um, you know I, I feel pretty comfortable now. Um, but there was there were certainly a few weeks that were a little uncomfortable in the, in the fall. It was like oh, I wish I had done a little more. It just will make it maybe less stressful in the sense that you're not spending all this time learning specific skills and like where do I find this thing in the program? Yeah. You already know it, and so you can have more time just enjoying playing around with design than the program. Maybe a couple more questions. Then we want to make sure we leave time to hear from. So, are any other questions in the audience? And, and Adrian, are there any online questions? There are a couple that I think we'll touch on in the final Q and A. So okay. let's move on to just hand, just real quick. And maybe are you using the computer at all? Or no? Nope. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, cost analysis. How involved do you get in in that um, for your for your client? And how do you how what is that process like? Um, well, we are learning about that okay. <laughs> as we speak. Um, that's typically not a part a part of the um, fall projects, and, and typically my understanding is that um, all the project groups in the spring will it's, it's more likely that we'll address in the spring. It's just something that um, the school agreed with the client to work on. We're just doing very rough cost estimates. Um, it's pretty new territory to me, but um, we are we've got uh, a contact in the community who comes in to work. The students, um, I, I believe he's got a background in um, contracting, architecture, engineering, something along those lines. So he's able to come in and help you break your partner project and come up with these cost estimates for various materials, structures, and so on and so forth. Other, uh, two, oh, one more question. Uh, how helpful do you think it was to come in with a PDC already? Permaculture uh, design. design. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I guess mine was really important because that's how I thought about Conway. <laughs> and I, so, so the whole um, process here was something that was already kind of familiar to me and clicked. Um, and uh, yeah, sure. I mean, any anything that any various experiences that kind of inform the different um, subjects that we act with here. I wouldn't say it's truly totally necessary where anybody who didn't have a PVC is lacking anything. I guess it just depends on your individual interests. Maybe about half the class this year? Yeah. Half. Something like that. Maybe yeah. an extra year to year. It's helpful. I would say it's, it's not uncommon. Required, but other people have, everyone's bringing something, so we will bring that respect. Yeah. Good. Okay, so they're here, they'll be here for lunch, too, so those of us who are staying for lunch can ask more questions there. We're going to start with Josiah in just a second. Thanks very much. Thanks. 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 So the class, just to give you a sense of a whole profile of a class, class of 2011 graduated a few years ago. They're very, um, they maintain good connections with each other. That's how we really know what they're all doing. The people don't let us know, and we can't really report back on it. So we just thought we'd give you a, a, a quick run through of what 18 people were doing, uh, are doing now. Um, so we'll just go through here. Melina came as a, a practicing architect. And uh, she's here um, and preparing to teach a course back in Monterey and urban planning. The future project is an urban planning project. Laura has her own design company in Connecticut. Uh, Malena and Laura also were two of the four people of this class who had a baby within a year after graduating. 
So that also affected their career path. Kate Chalakis, Paul mentioned earlier, she's working in an engineering firm specializing in stormwater. Recently won a, a prize. Susanna is working with the fish, and uh, she's a biologist for the an indigenous tribe in Washington. Genevieve is a full-time mother doing some design work on the side. Uh, Eloise, she was uh, originally from England. She came here from Morocco. She'd been a shoe designer for Jimmy Choo that gave us the high fashion life. Um, she went back to England and now she's coming, trying to get her green, green uh, card so she can come back to Seattle to work for that next year. Julie's a coordinator for partnerships and parks in Brooklyn. She's been working with the uh, Buckminster Fuller Institute mm -hmm. in New York City before that. Sean has done a lot of design and teaching, including um, working on uh, mushroom cultivation and food system design uh, projects down in New Jersey. Uh, Kate, another one of our um, new mothers, uh, she works for a stormwater uh, company in Durham, North Carolina, which is the effectiveness of stormwater designs. <coughs> Karen uh, is doing planning work down in North Carolina, where she's from. Emily's uh, working with a landscape designer out in San Francisco. She's also working on a project to um, she loves bikes and youth, and she's working on helping create a, uh, an organization for young people to get them into biking. Aaron is working with uh, the urban doing urban forestry in Worcester, which was devastated by a pest that wiped out a lot of its trees. Uh, Jan is a project manager. Can you talk about what she this? I think she has this transition, but the, yeah. she, her final project here was looking at, one of them was looking at um, the future use of a former nuclear power plant nearby in Rowe, Massachusetts, and so that she and her teammates were looking at the land around the power plant and suggesting to the town how it might be used. And she got into a very focused study of carbon credits and mitigation banking, other techniques, non-traditional techniques, and so she parlayed that into a job. She convinced a company in Boston that deals with land um, uh, to create a new position, a department, really, of ecosystem services. And that's been the focus of Aaron, and working for the trustees of reservations on Martin's Vineyard. Zach is a sustainability program coordinator at a community college at Kilo, and he's saying he's trying to develop a model of the curriculum inspired by the Congress School. Elaine is doing residential design, and she's, as Paul mentioned, she pursued another certification of and Jocko is uh, he's a retired high school science teacher, and so he's gotten into designing, doing master plans for schools. That's one of his. Uh, so he has his own firm in uh, restoration and project design. So one evening he went to a public meeting about open space in this town of Bernston, Massachusetts, and uh, three Conway students presented the plan that they were developing, and that's where he got the idea that he could retire. He come to the Conway School, and now he's launched it. What are called encore um, professions. Encore, you retire from what you've been doing for whatever number of years, and take up something you've always wanted. To do. And Melissa's up in Vermont working for a nonprofit. Uh, she's also doing some private design inside of Conway. Agriculture, working forests, um, education. So that's the class of 2011. That's 2011. And what we, we asked um, Josiah Simpson in the class of 2010, a live person, to come here. And so come on up, Joe, oh, right? So I have to talk about his work, uh, how he came to the Conway School, what he did here, anything else, and then mostly to be available for your questions. So thank you. Sure. I'm here to tell you how amazing and successful I am. Uh, <laughs> but only the truth. I'm but only sure. the truth. <laughs> but I, let's see, where do I begin? Uh, came to the Conway School um, after um, few years after graduating from Lewis and Clark College, I was a sociology major, and I had gotten involved in community development in Portland, Oregon, and in that process of working for um, this nonprofit, I discovered the power of design, and design is a tool, a problem-solving tool, and one of the um, folks that was most influential um, to me was somebody who had architecture and landscape architecture training. And so I was so impressed with what they would bring in terms of how they thought 
uh, the tools they had to use, um, their knowledge base in general, I said, that's what I want to aim towards. And so through uh, doing landscape construction, some apprenticeships with some design studios, um, and then some more formal training uh, in design, sustainable design in Arizona, I found the Conway School. And I grew up in Shelburne, uh, Massachusetts, next town north, and said, gosh, this was in my backyard the whole time. Looked at it more seriously. and. Um, I felt like it was a place where I could develop some of the skills that I felt that I needed in order to move to that next level. Um, and I'll talk about that next level in a minute. But one of the things, and why I came to the Conway School now, who knows? Um, but what I mean by that is, is you know, I graduated four years ago, and um, what the school gave me um, allowed me to do what I'm doing today. So. And I'll tell you that story in a minute. But the students did a great job, current students did a great job explaining you know, what they're doing here. And I can almost boil it down, getting rid of all the details, and tell you that what I got here is learning how to do goals articulation, um, understand the difference between an observation and a concept, and work on my feet, working on my feet combined with uh, having the experience with real clients, real projects. Um, and the thing about goals articulation, what I said first, is that as a student, you're asked to uh, explain what your reasons for being here are. What, you, what do you want to get out of it? And that's sort of the, the personal goals articulation process that Conway asks you to do. And so right there, you begin to develop clarity that is incredibly helpful. And those goals will change uh, over the course of the year. Um, when it comes to my work, I do landscape design, ecological restoration, productive conservation for a company in Greenfield. Um, goals articulation is incredibly important when it comes to understanding the client and understanding the scope of a project. So that process that I learned in Conway is something I still use today. Observation versus concept. Uh, the, my point being, uh, the drought made the red oaks drop their acorns early. What's the observation? What's the concept? Any guesses? Acorns dropping is the observation. Correct. Concept? <laughs> the drought did it. OK. So what, like, that's somewhat mundane. But the point is, is that when you go to work for a client, they say, the, the river is eroding. Uh, you know, I can't understand why. Uh, and so Conway has trained its students to go and observe what might be the possible things that work there. The client might have a whole slew of wild ideas. <coughs> Oftentimes, it's you know, in the way of erosion. It's a combination of things. But the point there is getting at the heart of what the project's really about, and understanding what the client is really about. Um, and then the last thing, working on your, uh, thinking on your feet, working with real clients, that experience um, is, I think, maybe most important in that after Conway, I had, you know, after my goals articulated, where do I want to go from here, uh, all this training of understanding the difference between an observation and a concept, um, and then all the cool design work I did, uh, graphic communication, et cetera, uh, is, well, where do I go from here? And what training do I need in order to get to where I want to be? And also, design is not a linear process. So thinking on your feet is critical because oftentimes you come up with a concept, and then you realize, oh, there's a law that makes it impossible to work 200 feet away from this perennial stream. Whoops, looks like I have to change everything, start over, or revise what I've done. So um, those are some of the three fundamental skills that I learned at Conway, not to mention a whole bunch of technical skills that I can tell you more about if you ask specific questions. Um,
But then after Conway, it was 2010. Um, uh, design studios, landscape architects hadn't finished purging their employees yet. Um, there was, uh, at that time, it felt like a real drought in the way of, of work. Um, so I actually started working for myself. It was incredibly tough, but I don't think that Conway, I think that Conway um, was one of the best places I could have gone in order to have the confidence to work for myself. don't necessarily recommend that being the goal for everybody. It just happened to be what happened to me. S supported myself through Summit Ridge Design, which is my landscape studio. Um, but then that experience, you know, working in the real world, uh, making a lot of mistakes, ended up leveraging me into a job a year and a half later, which I've been with to this day, and we have a ton of work. Um, depending on what studio you work for, um, where you are in the country, there are a lot of job opportunities, and there's many subcategories in the landscape design field, as you maybe saw in that last slide of, all, of the class of 2011 and all the different things that you're doing. I'm more typical uh, in the way of sort of landscape architecture, landscape design. Um, but as you saw, there's everything from ecological restoration, planning, trails, etc. So that's my ready for question. That's, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. What's some questions for Josiah? About his experience here or work his work now. Let's get Ken, all three of you up there, and turn this into a. I'll, I'll come up as well. Okay. And, uh, and who, who am I looking at? I, I was wondering what is this, this, this. You're looking at Rachel eight, eight people who are currently watching. Hi. Through YouTube. <laughs> Great meeting you. <laughs> um, nine now. Someone just logged on. Um, so we're going to do an open Q and A. So everything going back to. Well, let's do this. They went back to the studio where they're working. <laughs> <laughs> Not it's about lunchtime. Uh, yeah, so questions on anything. Uh, we'll launch off with one here um, from Jillian Ferguson. This is about um, projects. I live in a very urban environment, and I'm very interested in creating restorative commons by encouraging health and well-being through landscapes. Are there any projects that Conway has worked on in this area? Yeah, so um, hopefully you're able to see early on there was a discussion of our new uh, collaborative in Holio. And so we are especially committed to working in smaller uh, post-industrial cities. And we're really keen about developing, helping communities develop places for people that's really repurposing the city. And so we've got this incredible structure in so many cities um, in the Northeast and Upper Midwest where there, there are these opportunities. So um, while these cities, uh, it's the, uh, how's the population really up? Oh, you know, 40, it's 40,000 now, and it was built for 60,000. 60, 60, so you have this incredible infrastructure in these cities, and a lot of desire. Um, Adrian lives in, in Hello, a lot of really creative energy. And so um, we're, we want to tap into that. And so part of our, our collaborative, we did a test run of it last year, and the way it worked was, and the test was in southern Vermont around the city of Brattleboro. So we found a, um, a, a fellow for this, kind of this urban lab. Um, she was Kim Smith, whose name I think came up during the discussion. She was a biologist, and she wanted to become a designer planner. So she came on board as the, the fellow for the year. She worked on three projects in and around Brattleboro, um, including looking at um, one of the major gathering spots in Brattleboro, Vermont, is a big parking lot. It's, I mean, it's where people come together. It's a kind of commons. And so she looked at stormwater issues, um, tree canopy, heat island effect, a whole range of really important urban issues in developing a range of plans, alternatives for that site. And her other, the other project, um, which is on the table in the next area over, um, was to look at, um, at the town of Wilmington, Vermont their reaction response to flooding. So she did these three projects in and around Brattleboro, and now she works for the Wyndham County Regional Planning Commission. So that's our model to try to engage people either from a place, a specific urban place, or interested in working in urban situations to find these kind of, these kind of designs, um, and then help 
So we want to. We want. We have a mission that's. It's not just to educate people, but it's to change the world. So part of our mission is to get people into the situations where they can do just that. Uh, just a small, small example: the Lowell Food Security Plan. Uh, one of the ideas that that they were pursuing, exploring, was there's a lot of public space in the city, and could it could any of it be uh, providing food to the population? So. Sidewalks are public space. Um, trails or corridors. It could be linear orchards that, for example, could, could provide food to the public. Probably the best example in response to that question and the earlier question about creativity. Um, we have a project right now um, in also in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Holyoke has an innovation district where the state and city and others are encouraging innovators to come and to interact and to be very creative and, and entrepreneurial. And the innovation district itself hired us and now three students that students are working on a project to design the landscapes of the innovation district. The client basically said, we've been focused on what happens inside the buildings, how, how innovation might be spawned. Now we want to look at the land around the landscapes of this innovation district. How do they Get, how do they express the qualities of collaboration and spontaneous encounters and all those other things that, that make a place innovative? So, uh, anyone have a question for either Josiah or anyone? Is there another question on there the, is. the list? Another project related one um, in terms of the ability to complete them. <laughs> Many of the projects seem to be really broad and encompassing. Is it always possible to produce quality finished work with adequate community participation and background research within the short time frame dictated by the academic calendar? Well, 12 weeks is a very short time, and uh, that's about roughly what the project takes. And we always feel we could do more with more time, we could be more involved more research, we could spend more time in the development of ideas. Um, any of these projects could be a multi year project. So we understand that, and it's a trade-off in being able to do it straight. In a condensed, intense, ten-month master's degree project uh, program. Uh, that said, as Paul said, there's more that happens in 12 weeks than can happen in 12 weeks. Somehow, it, it happens. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a fair. Yeah, that's a, a fair assessment. So um, we we talk a, a lot about learning when. Good enough when something is good enough, because you learn that you could spend your entire life on any one aspect. I mean, it's all fascinating. When you're dealing with things that people are passionate about and you're passionate about, you can spend forever. And but to be a professional, to make a living, you have to learn about deadlines and saying that's good enough for right now. And I hope to work on another one of those projects, and I'll learn even more. But you you really it's it's a skill in itself. So you learn about design and. Some specific way you learn about managing a project in a specific way. Also. And, and I also like to say that there's there's a process, and I don't know if I should be looking at the, <laughs> the computer or not. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> this is one more attendee. But I don't want to talk with everyone. Equal, equal access. <laughs> what you learn here is, is is the winnowing down. So while you're starting with a broad idea and it's impossible to finish uh, in the most with the most detail in 12 weeks, what that project is trying to do, there's you learn how to uh, develop the scope. What's the most important thing? And if it's maybe not the most important thing for the project, it's what's the most important thing for you as a student to learn and do in order to get to where you want to go. Other questions? I don't know if I'm going to say that exactly, but um, uh, this is a uh, you know, a landscape design program, but I, I was curious if there are projects that have incorporated to the natural building components, um, as in, you know, like structures. So one of our faculty members, Kim Ursula, is an architect. So we have that expertise here, but we, we, the way we deal with natural building is we see it as one element of the broad landscape. So we don't focus on construction and structures other than we see them as a piece uh, of the larger puzzle that we're putting together. So it wouldn't be a good school to learn about more about natural building um, other than you would want to understand, depending on the project you're working on, understand enough of it so that you could um, 
make a space for it, make a place for it. Is that, yeah. For example, we had a, a project this fall where the, the client said we wanted an underground structure, a home. And it was about site and where's the best place on this um, 10 acre site to put an underground house. So that student, more than any other student in the class, had to learn about the structure and the, the construction and the needs and what where an existing uh, the floor level and the walkout and the drive and how much um, soil over the roof and what plants can you put uh, on the roof. So that that came from what that client was proposing as a use for that site and then figuring out what's is this site suitable at all for that and what are the benefits and what are the various uh, costs of that as well. Not so much financial in that case, but um, piece of that, but also the the answer to your question also comes down to context. As uh, Marie touched on in her presentation, how I think someone put it out really Paul pointed out also they don't always go going in know exactly what the right context is. There, which at which scale of context the solution to your problem, whatever. Um, and you know the, a, a building on your site is going to be part of the context that you will need to understand. But it's a huge part of the obviously the landscape, but we're not actually designing. Adrian, I wonder if you could say something about financial aid yeah. and all of that. Why would we seek other yeah. questions? So we have from Conway two sources of financial aid. There are um, a handful each year of need-based grants up to five thousand dollars, and those are based on submitting a. Uh, FAFSA application and, and uh, go to those who are deemed to be in most need based on the family contribution, estimated family contribution. So up to 5,000, a handful of those. And then we have what Paul mentioned, the Sustainable Communities Initiative Fellowship, which for next year is going to be two fellowships, two $10,000 scholarships for anyone who demonstrates a commitment to working in urban settings and community scale sustainability issues. Um, and there, there's just a, a one additional essay that you'll do on top of the normal application to show your interest in urban sustainability and, and your understanding of it and how you think coming to Conway will enable you to make a difference in, in those areas. Um, you're not, you won't be eligible to get both the need-based grant and fellowship, but if you get one. Did you say something about either deadlines for either of those or just in general? Yeah. Um, the fellowship will be, will accept applications now through the March 15th final application deadline. Um, and we will award those as a qualified applicant uh, emerges. So that's not, that's not a final deadline. We're not going to wait until March 15th to get those out. Um, and uh, I guess same thing for financial aid for the need based stuff, um, yeah, that will be awarded as people are admitted. And other sources, is anything you want to say about other sources of financial aid? There, there are, of course, lots of other sources of financial aid. Um, there are, I mean, you can always go back to your um, undergraduate college, and they have access to resources often. There are family-based foundations around the country that like to, um, you know, empower students to learn these kinds of things. Uh, there are, let's see, Mother Nature News has uh, a helpful uh, list of scholarships. Uh, we have some of them on my website, and uh, I intend on finding more of that for you. But there's a lot out there, and that takes a little bit of searching because we're talking about a niche field. But there's money. There are people who want to help you go to school and get yeah, fun. For, for some of those, it's really important to get your application into Conway early so yes. that you can meet their deadlines. Often they're not targeted for one-year programs, and so they have earlier deadlines you want to move pretty quickly. And one that people um, frequently overlook, um, which is, can be a very lucrative kind of arrangement, is the garden club. So that's the locality. So you can do those kind of possibilities too. Um, if people are from the, either, not just from Franklin County, but the three the three counties nearby, um, there are through the the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts. There are there's a whole host of scholarships there, but it takes some early action, some research. We're happy to help in any way we can. 
Other questions? Any more from our online audience? Yeah, 10 viewers. Are we ready to okay. go? Uh, yeah, then we will move on to lunch and conclude the online component of this. Thank you all for joining us and uh, for our, to our speakers for uh, cooperating with the new online component. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend, online folks. We're going to go have a delicious, locally catered yeah, lunch. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Come visit.